Tony Lee Sharpless case file hasn't seen activity in several years. The missing nurse from West Brandywine Township, Chester County, was last seen leaving a party in Lower Marion Township the night of August 22, 2009. Family has long hoped Tony would come home to her daughter. She left so many years ago. When her daughter ran to me saying, please find my mommy crying, that moment, that face, uh, changed everything for me. Welcome back to Solvable Mysteries Podcast. My name is Joras, and today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Tony Sharpless. Before we get going, I would like to give a shout out to James McInnes, who left a YouTube comment in one of my other podcast episodes, and he suggested this and some other very interesting cases that I'll try to get to shortly. So thanks again, James, and let's jump into this case. Tony Sharpless is an American woman who disappeared sometime in the early morning hours of August 23rd in 2009 from Gladwine, a township in Pennsylvania. At the time of her disappearance, Tony was a 29-year-old. She is a white female. Her height is 5 foot 5 and she weighed around 135 pounds. According to the Charlie Project, Tony was wearing a turquoise shirt, black ties, black sandals and a turquoise earrings as well. Some of Tony's distinguishing characteristics included that she had brown hair, she had blue slash gray eyes, and Tony's hair was actually dyed red at the time of her disappearance. Tony Sharpless was a native of the Philadelphia suburb of Downing Town, Pennsylvania. She was born in 1979. Her father died in an accident when she was only six years old, and after her father's death, Tony's mother Donna remarried with a man named Peter Knebel, who raised Tony and her sister Candy as his own daughters. At the age of 17, Tony became a single mother when she gave birth to a daughter and she began raising this daughter as a single mom. Tony's childhood and young adulthood were marked by her struggles with bipolar disorder, a condition that was diagnosed only in her adulthood. Tony and her family kept that information to themselves, and even after learning that she was bipolar, the difficulties caused by this disorder persisted. Now, doctors tried different combinations of different medications to control her bipolar disorder. Her condition had also led to drug and alcohol abuse. In 2008, she was arrested and convicted of driving while intoxicated. She spent the month of April 2009 in rehab. After finishing her rehab, Tony found a drug combination that seemed to work and that was contraindicated for alcohol consumption. Now, I believe this means that she should not consume alcohol while on this new drug combination that was her medication, essentially. It's also reported that Tony did not always take this new combination of drugs uh, that served as her medication for the bipolar disorder. Leading up to her disappearance in 2009, in the early 2000s, during her weekends, Tony worked as a nursing assistant at a local rehabilitation center, living with her daughter and parents in West Brandywine Township. Now, the money she earned from this job went to pay her tuition at Brandywine School of Nursing. After earning her degree in 2007, Tony took a job in the infectious disease ward 
at Lancaster General Hospital. Tony disappeared after a night out with a friend named Crystal Johns, whom Tony had just recently renewed her friendship with after not having contact with each other for a decade. Tony left her home with Crystal Johns on the evening of August 22nd in 2009, which was a Saturday, at around 9.30 p.m. in the evening. Their destination was Center City, which is basically downtown Philadelphia. After she left, her stepdad, Peter Knebel, expressed his reservations about a outing to his wife. Peter believed that the evening trip to the center city had been Crystal's idea and that Tony, who typically devoted her free time to her daughter and actually rarely went to nightclubs or bars in the first place, only went because Crystal had persuaded her to go. At the same time, uh, both Peter and Donna realized that Tony had been working very hard for a very long time and she has not been out in a long while. So, the two women left in Tony's car, which was a black 2002 Pontiac Grand Prix sedan. After stopping at Crystal's house in West Fallowsfield Township, first they went to the nightclub called Ice, located in a town called King of Prussia. This club has since been closed and you can no longer find it on the Google Maps. I've only found a few reviews on Yelp, but I think they are dated way back. And also, I would like to add that during my research, I did not find any information what actually went down at this nightclub called Ice, but I would probably assume that it was limited to just dancing on the dance floor. I do not know if any drinks were consumed in this particular club. After leaving the nightclub Ice, they drove around 22 miles to G Lounge, which is a nightclub in downtown Philadelphia. According to Crystal, they have met a lot of interesting people at G Lounge. One of them was Willie Green, who was a professional basketball player who was playing for the Philadelphia 76ers at that time. According to some sources, Tony was actually drinking alcohol in G Lounge. And let's remember that at this time, she was apparently taking medication that did not mix well with alcohol. Also, I found this pretty interesting because Tony is the designated driver at this for this night out, so she's drinking in Center City, which is downtown Philadelphia, and she's also the designated driver for the rest of the evening. And let's remember that only four months prior to this, she had completed her rehab for the DUI that she had from back in 2008, from one year ago. So this is definitely odd behavior. After partying in the G Lounge, they decided to leave for a small party that was taking place at Willie Green's house. And let's remember Willie Green is at G Lounge at this time as well. Uh, and the party was taking place in his home in Gladwine, which is an affluent neighborhood located around 12 miles away from G Lounge. According to Wikipedia, it's unclear if the two girls were invited to party in Willie Green's home even prior to them arriving to G Lounge because apparently Crystal knew Willie's brother Matt Green, who was also at the G Lounge that night. Or if they were invited by Willie Green himself, who met them for the first time in the G Lounge that night. This meant that Tony and Crystal would have to take Tony's car and drive 12 miles. Tony has been drinking 
at G Lounge for sure. I didn't find any details on who was driving or how did they get to Willie Green's home, but I definitely believe that Tony was driving the car. So this is already not a good sign. Tony and Crystal left G Lounge to go to Willie Green's house shortly after 3 a.m. on August 23rd. Back at home, Tony's 12-year-old daughter couldn't sleep that night and she actually sent a text message to Tony sometime around 2 a.m. that night. So Tony responded to this text around 57 minutes later after receiving the text message at 2.57 a.m. And she told her in the text message in her reply that uh, her daughter should go to sleep and that she would be home pretty soon. Now, another thing worth mentioning here is that Tony's phone has not been used ever since it was turned off around an hour later at 4 a.m. While at Willie Green's house, Tony and Crystal began drinking along with other guests at what has been characterized as more of a small gathering than a actual big party. Things went left when the group of people started playing the board game called Taboo, during which Tony reportedly made a remark to Crystal that Willie Green took as including an ethnic slur, although it was not intended that way. It seems like this potential misunderstanding was the key factor that led to Tony's erratic behavior for the rest of this evening at Willie Green's house. Willie Green made it known that he was offended and Tony, who was already feeling that other guests were ridiculing her at this small gathering, became very angry and started acting erratic. Around 5 a.m., she reportedly dumped a bottle of champagne on the kitchen floor and began kicking things. Billy Green went to Crystal and told her that it's time for her and Tony to leave his house. As the pair left Green's home, Crystal attempted to take the car keys away from Tony because she had less to drink than Tony that night, but Tony took them back and Tony was reportedly still very angry at this point and she was crying actually and she also accused Crystal of making fun of her in the party as well at this point. It also didn't help that once they left the house, a man called out from Green's house, jokingly warning them to be careful and not to hit any other cars. After driving approximately 500 feet away from Willie Green's home, Crystal, who later told police that neither of them were sober enough to legally drive, asked Tony whether she should really be driving right now. Given her previous DUI conviction that led to spending time in rehab just four months earlier. On top of that, Crystal also pointed out that at this point in time, Tony had been actually awake for 36 hours straight. Apparently, Tony had worked two double shifts in the hospital before going on this night out. Now, Tony's response to this was to stop the car immediately and tell Crystal to, quote, get the fuck out of my car, end quote. Crystal left Tony's car and Tony drove off and Tony has not been seen since then. At first, Crystal assumed that Tony would calm down and return for her. When it did not happen within a few minutes, she called Tony and the call went 
straight to voicemail. I assume this was because Tony had shut her phone off sometime earlier in Willie Green's home. Let's remember that this is happening around 5 a.m. and it's reported that well, her phone has been shut off at around 4 a.m. So an hour prior to this, Crystal was still too embarrassed by the circumstances and did not go back to Willie Green's house to ask for help. After waiting a little longer, she called her nephew for a ride back home. Later that morning, Crystal called Tony's sister, Candy Sharpless, to complain that Tony had abandoned her and said she would come around later to return some items that Tony had left at her house. However, when Candy explained to Crystal that Tony had not returned home last night, Crystal immediately sensed that something was off and she called the police. Candy later filed a missing persons report. Tony's friends and family made and distributed flyers, while the Lower Marion Township Police put out bulletins for her car. The next day, Tony's sister and friends searched by themselves, but they couldn't find her. And by nighttime, when we heard nothing, then at that point, I went to the West Brandywine Township Police Department and filed a missing persons report. The police subpoenaed her credit records, her bank statements, her phone statements, and pinged her cell phone. We did find out that uh, she's, the phone stopped working or was turned off soon after she had dropped Miss Johns off. Police say there was money left in Sharpless's bank account when she went missing. Her family says that's a sign she didn't take off on her own free will. At first, it was speculated that Tony, who was intoxicated and sleep deprived, had accidentally driven down a boat ramp and ended up in the nearby Schuylkill River. A Texas firm that was hired to search the river using side scan sonar actually found 12 vehicles and nine of them had been reported stolen and three were untraceable since those vehicles identification numbers the win numbers had been removed however none of these cars was actually tony's this uh, led me to believe that most likely, Tony's car was not in the Psykill River. The most important clue in this case was uncovered in September of 2009, two weeks after Tony disappeared, when an automated license plate reader in Camden, New Jersey, that was just across the Delaware River from Philadelphia, recorded a hit on Tony's car's license plate number. Now, the Camden police did not notify Lower Marion police that was investigating Tony's disappearance of this clue until a few days after it happened, and then later efforts to locate Tony's vehicle in Camden or somewhere nearby were unsuccessful. We had what was called a, an automatic license plate reader read numerics of her license plate in Camden. When I was researching this case, I stumbled upon the YouTube channel called Adventures with Purpose. And according to them, these license plate readers are almost 100% flawless. In fact, when they realized this fact and um, this YouTube channel, Adventures with Purpose, they specialize in searching rivers for cars in order to solve missing people's cases. They found out about this clue and they decided to not search the Psykill River because one of the guys from that YouTube channel actually works or used to work with these license plate readers and he was convinced that the license plate reader did in fact capture Tony's car. So there was no point to search the Psykill River as Tony's car was most likely not in the river. In late October of 2009, on the same year when Tony disappeared, police records showed that they had worked their 
final lead, although the case remained open. But on the same month, Tony's mother, Donna Knebel, retained a private investigator, Eileen Law, to help find her daughter. Now, a segment on CNN's Nancy Grace's show captured Eileen's attention. She took the case for a symbolic fee of $1 in order to make it legal. Eileen Law set up a website and a hotline number. Many tips were phoned into her office. Callers reported seeing Tony and or her vehicle all over the Philadelphia area, from Lancaster, where Tony worked, to Kenneth Square. Another woman who was returning from work after a night shift at 1 a.m. saw an apparently abandoned black sedan matching the description of Tony's car in Camden beneath an overpass after crossing the Benjamin Franklin Bridge. She notified the police there, but they had no record of this call. I don't know exactly when this call to law enforcement about this black sedan vehicle beneath an underpass was made. However, the fact that apparently law enforcement did not keep a record of this information is definitely fairly suspicious. The biggest um, cluster has been in Camden. Over the years, the private Miami, detective on the case Miami. says there have been more sightings in those areas and in Lancaster, where she worked at Lancaster General as a nurse. Every single one of them I go through. The tips have slowed down, but still trickle in occasionally. Due to these tips, Eileen Law started believing that Tony's disappearance had some connection to Camden. Now, Tony's mother, Donna, reported that her daughter had a poor sense of direction, even under ideal conditions, and may have headed for the nearby Cycle Expressway, part of Interstate 76, to return home after abandoning Crystal. However, the nearest exit to the Cycle Expressway was Hollow Road, and it only allows eastbound entry, not westbound, which Tony would have wanted to take in order to return home. Now, this means that by accident, Tony could have been heading eastbound on the I-76, not west, and if she went eastbound, it would have taken her towards Philadelphia, and obviously if she kept going, eventually to Camden, which was the opposite direction from her home. Eileen Law also noted that Tony's car was very low on gas when she left for the night out. It apparently had less than a quarter of a tank full, and Tony could likely have ran out of gas soon after she left Willie Green's house. Tony did not have her ATM card with her, so she might have been short on cash to refuel and thus would have had to rely on whomever she encountered to help her. Eileen Law soon came to believe that Tony was still alive. She was perhaps forced into prostitution against her will. The different places around the Philadelphia area where Tony was reportedly sighted made Eileen Law believe that she was being moved around. In December of 2012, two years after Tony's disappearance, Eileen Law received a handwritten letter allegedly sent by Tony Sharpless, postmarked November 29th, 2012, in Trenton, New Jersey. This anonymous letter the person who wrote it says they were paid to move Tony's car out of Camden, New Jersey. The letter says a friend of the person who paid him to move the car got into a fight with a girl and the girl died. Police say they were sent the letter too. They investigated and determined it was a prank. The writer of this letter said that they had tried to give their information to the Philadelphia police but had been told the case was not in their jurisdiction, so an 
officer there had taken them aside and given them Eileen Law's address. And this sounded a little bit fishy to me personally. Um, the writer also claimed that they had been contacted by a friend near the end of September of 2009, uh, shortly after Tony disappeared, and was offered $5,000 in cash to take Tony's car from Brooklaw, New Jersey, near Camden, to a shop in Boston. If they completed this trip, they could also keep the vehicle's license plate. The writer also claims that they were asked by this friend if they knew anyone in their late 20s who wanted to create a new identity and was also offered a social security card to give to such a person. The writer claims that they needed the money, so they had delivered Tony's car to Boston the following day. When they delivered it, they not only took the license plates, but also cleared out the glove compartment and implied that they had found Tony's cell phone inside of the glove compartment. They also wrote down the car's vehicle identification number, you know, the WIN number. Once they returned to Camden, the friend gave them more information about this car and why they had had to take it to a chop shop, which is, you know, essentially a business that pretends to be a body shop but actually dis dissembles stolen vehicles and sells their, their parts. So the explanation was that the car was not stolen, but it was missing, and that a Camden police officer got into a fight with a girl, afterwards she died, and he needed to get the car out of New Jersey. The reason the writer had waited over three years to write this letter was because they had put the license plates and the social security card into a box in their garage and forgotten about it until their daughter had recently rediscovered it while playing. The writer had gone back to New Jersey to help some friends affected by Hurricane Sandy and decided to write this letter. As proof, the writer of the letter included not only the license plate number of Tony's car, but also the last five digits of its WIN number, as well as Tony's personal phone number, represented as her social security number. The license plate number had been widely publicized during the initial media coverage of the disappearance, so it could not be held as proof. However, the other two numbers had not been made public and they were also correct. Eileen Law told the media in 2017 that she had also received letters in 2013 with information that corroborated information from this 2012 letter, and she now regarded the account stated in this 2012 letter as plausible. Law enforcement, on the other hand, said that Tony's car win number is included in reports on the case, and these reports would be widely available to anyone in law enforcement. Around the same time, police also received two potentially promising tips by phone that turned out to be hoaxes. The first from someone claiming to be an officer of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service who had found both the car and a woman matching Tony's description on the property of the agency's Toronto offices was from a false address and phone number. The Toronto police also did not have Tony in custody, as this fake co caller claimed, and the second was allegedly from a deputy sheriff in South Dakota who claimed he had recovered Tony's car. Now, officers at this department said no one by the name this caller gave worked there, so both calls, according to police, were hoaxes, and both of them, according to police, were made by the same person, by the same hoaxer. There was further confusion when 
uh, after Eileen Law turned the 2012 letter over to police, as she claims, she later disclosed it to the media in early 2013, meaning that she only told the media about this letter after she already gave the letter to police. But police said they had not been made aware of this letter before reporters started asking them about it in 2013, so it's unclear if they ever received this letter or they disregarded this letter. This is a little bit confusing right here as well. And in 2016, Eileen Law said that she did not know what, if anything, police had done with this letter. So it's unclear if police has investigated or not. Now, let's go back to Crystal Johns, the friend who was last known to speak with Tony. This friend, Crystal, came under the suspicions of Tony's family members ever since Tony had disappeared. They noted that she pleaded guilty to harassment charges back in 2005 and questioned her account of the night when Tony disappeared. One of Tony's friends said that, quote, Tony would never leave another woman on the dark street in Philadelphia and what woman in her right mind would get out of the car there and wait an hour for her to turn back? Donna Nebel, Tony's mother, is not even sure that the last text from Tony's phone was actually written by her. She also questions why Willie Green's house was not searched. Now, Peter Knebel and Gigi Hayes, who is Tony's friend from her nursing school days have both publicly speculated that Crystal's account might be a cover story for an incident that occurred at the party. So we're getting those Tamla Horsford vibes here, you know what I mean? Gigi Hayes herself stated that Tony didn't burn her bridges with her parents and there was no reason why she couldn't come home. The Nebels were advised by law enforcement to not try and contact Crystal, and the Nebels also said that Crystal has not contacted them either. Police have cleared Crystal of any involvement. Her phone records confirmed her attempt to call Tony around the same time she drove off, as well as another call she made to her nephew to come and pick her up. Crystal had also passed a lie detector test that apparently she asked for in order to clear her name. Police also stated that Willie Green has also been cleared. Police described him as more than willing to cooperate. Willie Green has never spoken publicly about this case. All the other guests at his house that morning were also ruled out as having any involvement in Tony's disappearance. Private investigator Eileen Law also believes that Crystal is innocent after having spoken to her privately. As of 2017, Donna Nebel believes that her daughter is dead. On the other hand, Eileen Law continues to investigate the theory that Tony was taken by human traffickers who also took her cell phone and credit card. Eileen Law told the media that in, back in 2011, a woman she described as a dancer in a Midwestern city contacted her, claiming to have met Tony. Her description of the woman's body piercings and stretch marks were confirmed by Donna Nebel. So once again, we have a lot of very interesting sightings. I've spent a good amount of time thinking about this case and coming up with potential theories to what may have happened to Tony Sharpless. I decided to group two different scenarios. One scenario would involve everything ranging from suicide to a runaway theory to an accident theory, essentially meaning that it was no, there was no foul play involved. And then obviously the second scenario would be that there was some sort of foul play in this situation. Let's talk about the first scenario. At the time of her disappearance, Tony had not slept for around 
36 hours, she was intoxicated and potentially on medication that did not mix well with alcohol. She had also finished rehab just four months ago. This is a potentially deadly combination. Nothing from my research suggests to me that Tony wanted to run away or start a new life, so I don't think that's what happened here. The Cycle River has been searched and multiple vehicles were located in the water and the sonar team from the YouTube channel called Adventures with Purpose actually decided not to even investigate the river after realizing that a license plate reader in Camden recorded Tony's car license plate number. Now this strongly indicated to me that her car is probably not in that river because I would assume it would be already found. Now, speaking about the second scenario, that there was foul play involved, I would like to start off with, I don't think that Crystal or anyone else at Willie Green's house party had anything to do with her disappearance. I think staging such a crime would have been very difficult. Law enforcement was able to clear everyone in this case, and Willie Green himself had a lot to lose as he was a well-paid NBA player. Tony's phone and credit card has not been used ever since she disappeared, indicating that she is not alive anymore. Tony's car was very low on gas when she left for the night out, and it's likely she would have ran out of gas, and it's assumed she wouldn't have enough money for a refuel. I found conflicting reports when researching. It's stated in Wikipedia that her credit card was not used since her disappearance, but it's also stated that she did not have her ATM card with her at the time she vanished. So I have to wonder, has this credit card ever been located? If Tony didn't have it on her, does that mean that she left it back home? And if so, then her parents should have located it by now, right? The biggest clue in this case was the fact that two weeks after Tony disappeared, an automated license plate reader in Camden, New Jersey, just across the Delaware River from Philadelphia, recorded a hit on Tony's car's license plate number. These license plate readers are said to be very reliable, therefore this lead seems to be very credible and my research led me to believe that the general flow of the investigation is circling around the Camden area. I don't know if the letter that investigator Eileen Law received in 2012 is a hoax or not, but I'm leaning towards it being a hoax. The reason why I think so is that there were other proven hoaxes in this case and law enforcement also ruled this particular letter as a hoax as well. But, on the other hand, this letter would potentially incriminate a fellow police officer, so you could argue that police don't want this information to come out. And also, it seems that the win number has not been released to the public, but it was mentioned in the internal police reports, and anyone in law enforcement could look it up. The backstory of the writer going and helping relatives in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy and then deciding to write the letter seems strange to me, but also plausible. So the credibility of this letter is still up for debate in my opinion and perhaps someone in the comments section could chime in as well. I do believe it's possible that at least one or two sightings of Tony in the Camden, New Jersey area are credible. I don't know the manner of these sightings, whether she was seen just walking on the street or if she was cited as a human trafficking victim. I assume that given her medical condition, it might be possible to keep her restrained for a prolonged period of time, but at the same time, I could see her escaping such captivity as well, so it's hard to say if those sightings are credible. I am leaning towards foul play in the disappearance of Tony Sharpless. I don't think Tony was driving her car when it was recorded 20 miles away in Camden, 
two weeks after her disappearance. I don't have a specific scenario that could explain why her car was in Camden, but I highly suspect that foul play was involved and that Tony is now deceased. Guys, this is where I'm going to be wrapping up uh, on this episode. I hope you all enjoyed. Please leave a like or a comment on the YouTube channel if you have your own personal theories to what may have happened to Tony Sharpless. I hope you will all have a nice rest of the week and I will catch you on the next episode. Until then, please stay safe and peace out.